There we go. And it looks like it's picking up the mic. All right. Yeah. So one of the things that students have a question about is why do we talk about what seems like an HR issue in a marketing ethics course? And again, one of the things that should come tripping off your tongue if you've had any of my classes is that marketing is the only fully integrated function of the firm. And what that means is that marketing is the only function that works both internally and externally to ensure that all aspects of the firm add value and contribute value to the overall customer, client, constituent satisfaction. And so unlike accounting, which only deals with internal numbers of the firm, marketing seeks to add value across all aspects of the firm. And one of the things that we have come to recognize as marketers is that an enormously important part of making sure that firms are maximizing their efficiency is getting employees to live the brand. In the 1980s, it became very fashionable for companies to look around and say, hmm, we got a lot of these old guys around here and they take a lot of vacation, they take a lot of sick leave, and if we got rid of them and hired people like you, wouldn't we be more efficient and more productive and better at fulfilling our mission? And they started to reduce force and lay all these people off. That's illegal, by the way. There's something in federal law called the ADEA, the Age Discrimination and Employment Act, and you're not allowed to do that. But with all of these illegal reasons for terminating employees, it's very difficult to prove that that's why you've done it, particularly if you're doing it in large numbers rather than selectively. And so this became, you know, sort of fashionable to replace older workers with younger workers who don't have kids, who will work harder, and, and that worked for a while. There is now a recognition, largely as a result of branding scholars doing research on what's called living the brand and looking at these companies that outperform other companies like historically Southwest. Now in recent history, Southwest as a result of their legacy system has had some problems with customer management. But by and large on the whole, over the course of airline history, Southwest is one of the few airlines that's never gone broke. Almost all of the other large carriers have gone broke at some point in time. And Southwest employees by and large on the whole have been fiercely loyal to that company, and Southwest has outperformed other airlines over, over the long haul. So there is a, a recognition that yes, you can replace employees, but at what cost? That, that no one is irreplaceable, but what is the, um, what is the from the current slide? What is the cost? So in a previous edition of your textbook, and I use this because these um, questions are are kind of interesting. By the way, I apologize. I was on the phone. Uh, my mother's at the hospital, and so that's why I was on the phone. It's also why I'm wearing all of her jewelry today. No, I'm, I'm not planning on becoming a drag queen before your, your very eyes. Uh, they had to do an MRI on her this morning, and so they had to take everything off, and they handed it all to me this morning as I took her to the hospital. So uh, I apologize for that. This is like one of those moments where I, I should have done this before. You know, it, we all have 
as a result of the fact that we work 24 seven now because COVID did some really wonderful things. It also did some really horrible things. One of the wonderful things is that we recognized that people don't have to necessarily be tied to a physical location to do their job. They can do their job in many respects by working at home. But it also means that we're now juggling working while we're also juggling family obligations and everything else, where it used to be you went to an office and if you were at the office, that, that was it. So, you know, it's okay if, if you, for example, have to take a phone call in my class. I just think that, you know, it's probably polite and I should have done this uh, at the beginning of class, come in and said, I'm on the phone with the doctor. I, I apologize, but I'll be with you all in, in a minute. So, um, you know, one of these soft skills that, that you all need to pick up on is that we all, we all recognize that you've got this phone and it's probably going to go off in meetings. You just need to let people know, like, hey, I'm expecting a call from, you know, X, Y, and Z. And if I have that, I, I probably need to take it. So these cases that were in a previous edition that I really like, the first one was the firing of a salesman after he had made a huge commission and they give the commission then not to the salesman. They had a, they had a policy that they paid commissions at the end of the quarter. And if you didn't stay to the end of the quarter, they didn't pay the commission. The commission went to your boss. They fire him and they pay the commission to his boss, who is the person who fired him. Fired him. Ethical or unethical? Just on a prima facie basis. Unethical. Why is that unethical? Because you didn't put in the work to earn that money. You just are collecting on it. If you're the sales manager, aren't you responsible for a big portion of that? I think you're responsible for hiring for people. You're, you're responsible for managing the people, not all of the sales. What if, what if you found out on, on a first glance, that sounds mm -hmm. unethical. What if it was that the salesperson was in training, the boss gave them the lead and was primarily the one that was responsible for closing the deal. By the way, this is one of the reasons I why a lot of people don't want to go into sales management. I still feel like that's unethical because taking all of the compensation when you didn't do all the work, even though you're in training, you're still doing the work. Okay. I guess it depends. Every ethical situation can be viewed as, well, it depends because it depends on every single individual circumstance because nothing is ever the same. Like no two situations are exactly alike. So you'd have to what? Guess, determine all the factors. Okay. So what would be one of, with regard to compensation mm -hmm. and salespeople, what would be one of the factors that would be important in determining who was largely responsible for the sale and who should get the commission? What would be a major factor in that? I would say that if the salesman had to use their sales skills in order to close the sale, if right. they're the one that established a relationship with the customer and took them all the way through the sales cycle and finished the sale, then they should be the salesman who is responsible for that should be compensated for it, not okay. their boss who hired them. So what does the sales cycle start with then? That would be, I think, one of the most difficult things. So every sales textbook will tell you, and I think it's wrong, Every sales textbook will tell you that the hardest thing in sales is hearing no. It's being rejected. That you hear, I mean, you're going to hear no. I think that is actually the wrong answer because people who go into sales know that. They're usually prepared for it psychologically. What I don't think a lot of salespeople are actually prepared for psychologically is the loneliness of prospecting. Most of our sales students are extroverted individuals. There are very few that are, you know, like shy, retiring, demure wallflowers. They're, they're all kind of people, you know, extroverts. And so I think one of the hardest parts of selling is actually the lonely part, which is prospecting. And prospecting is enormously difficult for most students, it's also one of the most difficult things for us to teach because it's difficult for us to simulate. We can simulate, and we do, 
And we just came back from ICSC and Lauren Harmon placed fourth. This is the second year in a row that we have had a top tier challenger. Last year, we placed overall third in the competition and our role play competitors placed second and third respectively. And so we can simulate that in the lab with a great deal of precision, how a sales call. So we give you a product, we train you on the product, and then we provide you with a, a mock buyer and you go in and try to sell to that mock buyer. We can do that. And most of our sales students are really good at that because it's presenting, it's talking. They like to talk to people. They are social creatures by and large on the whole. Prospecting is hard because it involves doing things that are not necessarily social. It involves the thing that students like the least, which is research. And I actually do have a prospecting practice that we do in my sales class that I attempt to simulate what it is like to prospect. And students hate that assignment because it's lonely. And I deliberately pick things that are hard. So when we used to sell, for example, when Paycom was our major sponsor, we used to say, I would, I would divide Oklahoma up into quadrants and I would assign teams. I would say, go find a business that needs Paycom in this quadrant because that way I could ensure that you weren't just going to the business that you work for and using them as the example of prospecting. And then I would say, once you, once you identify a business that needs Paycom in this sector, so I divided Oklahoma up into quadrants and I said, you can't use Oklahoma City and Tulsa businesses. You're going to have to go to a business that's not in the Oklahoma City or Tulsa metropolitan region. You're going to have to go. And I said, like a town under 15,000, which is the majority of towns in Oklahoma. I need you to find who the decision maker is at that business, what their social style is based on what you can find, and then what you think their vowels style is. Because social styles will tell you how to communicate with someone. Vowels will tell you what they want to communicate about. And it's, it's a hard, and students hate it because it involves like digging, right? And researching. That's a really hard part of sales. So if the sales manager was the one who came up with the prospect, should he be the one that's paid the majority of the commission? No. I no. still say no. Why? Because the process of making that sale, you can be told a million times to still keep coming at them and still get to finish and close that sale. How much time are you putting into that? How much time did you put into that cell? How much time did you put into that prospect? I think the prospecting, trying to figure that out and coming up with that lead, a qualified lead. So there, when again, when we talk about sales and when we, when we talk about prospecting, a lead is anybody, right? I could be a lead. And one of the things that I like to use as an example, I'm fascinated by copiers because they are enormously complex pieces of machinery compared to what I grew up with. So I actually remember, and you can, you can Google this, you all don't remember this, but when I was in elementary school and even through part of high school, the way teachers gave us assignments was on something called a ditto. Mm -hmm. And so they, you would make a master copy on this, this special type of paper that was called a ditto master paper or something like that. And you put this ditto master on this drum in this machine. And when I was a little kid, you actually hand cranked this machine. There was actually a crank on the side of this machine and it would transfer from that master on this drum to other copies. And I think you actually had to use special ditto copy papers. I don't think you could use just standard weight paper, but they came out and a the thing I remember about you one of the one of the strongest senses that you have is the sense of smell. One of the most uh one of the most interesting things about cooking is that really what most people think they're tasting is actually smell, right? So it's, a, it's an enormously important part. 
the ditto had a specific, very sort of sickeningly sweet smell to it. I remember it. Um, I actually kind of liked it, but I'm weird. I like the smell of gasoline as well. And so I remember like, you know, I, I loved being the one that the teacher would say, go make dittos of this assignment. And so we went from that to my mother had a copy machine in her office and they had copy machines in schools, but they only let, it was very, it was really expensive to make copies and they only did it for special things. And usually only the office, they, they protected the copy machine like it was you know, a gold bar and you, you did these dittos. Now the thing about dittos was the first one that you copied in the ditto machine was pretty good. But after that, the more copies you made, the more the ditto got blurry and it was hard to read. And so after about 25 copies or so, you had to remake the master before you could run more dittos. But this was still far better than what teachers did when my grandmother started teaching school in a one-room schoolhouse, which was, you know, write it on a chalkboard and have everybody copy it down, right? That's, that's much, much better. So we went from the ditto machine to the copy machine, my mother's copy machine in a real estate office. And they used to make forms in real estate. So when you, when you did a contract, you would type it up on a typewriter, which you all have never seen. And it was in like triplicate form and they had what were called and they still we have remnants of this in in our lexicon today when you cc somebody on an email that stands for carbon copy so they used to have these forms real estate contracts came in these pre-printed forms and there were three of them so you had the top copy which was kept by the real estate office under the top copy there was something called a carbon paper between that and the next copy. And then on the third copy, there was another piece between the second and the third, there was another piece of carbon carbon paper. And then they came up with this stuff that was like invisible until you touched it. And then it, you got rid of the carbon copy. So you just had three sheets, but that's still, we, we say carbon copy on email CC. Um, it comes from these old fashioned way of doing things where we had these typewriters, you would type up a contract, the real estate company kept a copy of the contract that was the top. They gave one to the buyer and one to the seller to, to consider the offer. And then everybody would have to execute the form three different times. You would sign if they agreed to the contract, you know, the, the buyer would, would sign it. Uh, and then the seller would, would sign all three copies. So they had this copy machine in my mother's office because they were starting to do away with that. And you just make a copy of the contract rather than having it. Cause again, like the ditto machine, by the time you get through to the third page, it wasn't quite as clear as it was. And also if you messed up, you had to go back and you couldn't, you could erase on the first one. They, these typewriters would have this ribbon in them that was called a whiteout ribbon. And the whiteout ribbon would go, you'd back up a space and hit the correction key and then type what you had typed. I and mean, this is, I, I know like you all can't even fathom this. So copy machines came along, but you had to pick up the top of the lid, place the copy down, make the number of copies you wanted. If you had multiple pages, you did that each time. And then you would go like in my mother's real estate office as a kid, she would have me do what was col called collating. The, the copies. So I would sit there and like lay them down on a table and then I would staple them, right? The copy machines do all this now for you. Like this is fascinating to me. So I'm fascinated by copiers. And my point is, is that, you know, I'm, I'm a, a lead maybe for somebody who wants to sell a copier, but am I a qualified lead? So the copy machine that we have upstairs here in the college of business, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's probably not hundreds of thousands of dollars, but you know, they're probably like, I don't know, $20,000 now. They've gotten cheaper. At one point in time, I remember when I was a, a liberal arts professor, they paid like $150,000 for this copy machine that did all this collating and stapling and all this stuff for you. So I'm fascinated by this, right? So I might, I'm, I'm a lead because I'm fascinated by copiers. Am I really a qualified lead? No, because I'm not going to spend 100 As fascinated as I am by this copy machine, 
I'm not going to spend hundred thousand dollars on a copy machine. I don't, I don't, why would I need that? I don't even make copies for the most part anymore. I don't give you exams on hard copy, right? I do exams. They're online, they're essay, they're open note, open book. I don't ever, I don't ever print off a piece of paper. So I'm not, I'm not even a qualified lead for this. All of that's really hard figuring out, you know, even if I am, let's say I become dean of the college business and now I've got to buy this copier and any purchase of that size I'm going to have to assign for, am I a qualified lead at that point? Well, I'm still maybe not the qualified lead because any purchase over $5,000 here at the university, who has to sign for it? Not the dean of the college. Only two people on this campus that can sign for that purchase. The vice president of administration and finance and the president. That's it. No one else can sign for that purchase. Crazy, isn't it? Crazy that we have that restriction. Yeah, it is. I'm vice mayor of the city of Guthrie. We allow our city manager to sign for stuff up to $100,000. UCL won't let, won't let anyone sign other than the vice president. Do you know how many contracts the VP for administration has to sit there and sign every day? Every day. I couldn't imagine. $5,000 is nothing. I couldn't imagine. Right? Yeah, because in terms of purchases for like UCO, I bet you there is barely any purchase that is under $5,000. $5,000, right. Our toilet paper purchase is, is under 5, I was about to, you know. to say that. Yeah. What? Yeah. You know, literally, our, our, our toilet paper purchase. Yeah, it has to be. Way. It has to be. With right. the amount of bathroom. Yeah, it has yeah. to be. I did a study when I was a political scientist because I used to tell my students this and I did the study to figure it out. I actually calculated the cost of changing a light bulb here at UCO. And this was this was 27 years ago or something like That's that. Crazy. It was $100 at the time oh. to change a light bulb. Just one? It, just one. Just to change one light bulb. By the time you added in what it costs to go through purchasing to buy the light, because again, we're not going down to Walmart and buying yeah. a bulb. light bulb, right? We're, we are sourcing the purchasing of light bulbs from someone who submits an R, we put out an RFP, a request for proposal. You know, these vendors come back with, suppliers come back with what they, what they will charge per light bulb based on all, you know, we've got all kinds of different light bulbs. In this classroom, how many different kinds of light bulbs do we have? Well, we have at least two that I can see. There's also right? a light in the projector. There's also a light in the projector. You know, that, all of this, it was, at the time, I tracked it down and figured out how much it costs to change a light bulb. Because if I'm in my classroom and this light goes out, can I just get up there on the ladder and change the light bulb? No. I have to put in a work order. You have to put in a work order. Which at that time was typed by a secretary <laughs> on these carbon copied forms in triplicate. And the department would keep a copy. They would send it to the dean's office who would keep it a copy. And then they would send it to the physical plant, to the work order processing clerk, who would then look at it, assign it to an electrician, and they would come out and change the light bulb. See you later. You have to have an electrician change the light bulb? That's who changes the light bulbs, yeah. Okay. At, the, at the time, that's who changes. I don't know who changes the light bulbs now. Like, is there not like a maintenance department, like in general, or is it, it was all the under maintenance? It was electricians that were under maintenance, and that's who changed the light bulbs. That's an expensive light bulb change. Yeah. I don't know who does it now. I, I would have to go through and redo the study and figure out how much it costs to change a light bulb. It's a lot of money. Right. So even if, if I become dean of the college, am I, am I a qualified lead? Well, I may be somebody who's part of the influence because I'm going to say that copy machine will not work for us because we still, I don't, I don't know why we have instructors that still give tests with, and with chat GPT, apparently they're, they're becoming more and more common again. We went from like not having a whole lot of tests actually being printed to instructors again now because of chat GPT going back they're actually, I think the blue book, the company that manufactured blue books, like practically went broke. They're now blue books are coming. You all have never seen a blue book. Have you You've yes. never had a blue book exam? Yes. What? what is that? You don't know what a blue book is. <laughs> when, I was going, when I was going through college, you had essay exams and they would, you would go over to the, the bookstore and you would buy these things called blue books, which were blue. And they had your name and the date, and you'd put your section number on, on the cover. 
And they came in like two sizes. There were large blue books and small blue books. And your professor would say, I will, I will not accept anything other than large blue books or small blue books. They came in, I, maybe they came in three sizes, but I know there were at least two. And professors would tell you, you have to have, for this exam, you have to have a blue book or you have to have a Scantron. And you would go over and you'd buy the Scantron or the blue book. And then it had lines. It looked like notebook paper. And you would write in the blue book. It would be stapled. You know, it, it had a staple down the seam together. They had probably 10 to 15 pages in each blue book. And you would turn those in. In law school, they purchased the blue books. You bought them from the professor. And they brought them in to make sure that you hadn't written in the blue books in advance. Right prior to getting them. So they would they would give everybody and you'd go up and you'd have to buy blue books. I think they were 15 cents from the professor. And and depending on how many blue books, the average law school exam that I took, I would fill seven to eight blue books. Because every exam was a three and a half to four hour exam. There's one grade in law school in every class and it's the final exam. And it's all it was all done on blue book. And so you'd sit there and you'd write for three and a half to four hours. Now they let you type it, but they, they put a, 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 a some kind of lockdown on your, at the time when I was in law school, you could type if you had an accommodation for a disability, but they inserted something into your computer or they, they made you bring a typewriter if you wanted to type the exam. <laughs> People had these portable typewriters and you'd have to bring a typewriter. Like yeah, in a literally. briefcase? In a briefcase. Like, okay. They had these like portable typewriters that you carried around with a, a handle and and that's what uh -uh. people took their exams on. So, yes. This I'm just curious. Did you guys ever have any court reporters that came in and tried to go up through law school and use the little court reporter boxes and try to type exams? Uh, I don't remember any court reporters going through law school when I was was there, but they did. They still do have. They oh, still yeah, have stenographers. Yeah. Super Even cool. though I think that's becoming a thing of the past because a lot of courts have now gone to just having it. Um, digitally saved. And if you need a transcript after the, the case, they will either have somebody or the diction has gotten so good that um, now they will listen to it and watch it and they'll correct it if it's not getting the right words. But they're pretty good to the point that if you order a transcript for a hearing, they, they will produce it, but they don't have somebody. Literally, when I started practicing law, there was a court reporter in every courtroom that would sit there and, and now you have to request it uh, be recorded. Really? And if you don't in, in Oklahoma in lots of places, it's automatic, but in Oklahoma, we have two kinds of courts in Oklahoma. We are called courts of record and courts, not of record and not of record is misleading because they actually do have records. It just means that there's not somebody sitting there taking everything down. And even in courts of record in Oklahoma, unless it's certain types of cases, they don't actually have um, court reporters there anymore. You just, everything's done by a court minute. So you'll you'll just, you know, make your arguments, the judge will make a ruling. And then if you have a problem, it's hard to appeal. So anyway, all of this is to say, I think prospecting is really like, you're assuming, I think one of the things that makes this case interesting is that it's all or nothing. Should it be paid in proportion to the amount of work that each party did? So, for example, if the sales manager was responsible for the prospect and that was a lot of work, should he get a percentage of it and the employee should get a percentage of it? Would that be more equitable? Yeah. Yeah. Fair. Who closed the deal? Well, let's say the salesperson actually, let's let's assume that the salesperson actually closed the deal, okay. but the sales manager provided the prospect. How did they get the lead? What? The how did they, well, like, how did the sales manager get the lead? I'm going to assume that he prospected. Okay. The marketing department. Right? Is that important? Yes. Because yes. if, like, the lead just comes up to you and tells you everything they want, then that's a lot easier than going out and, like, trying to find one. Sure, Absolutely. Most businesses, though, don't have the luxury of just having somebody. I mean, you know, car dealerships, right? Actually, most people in the past, historically speaking, car dealers um, didn't prospect much. They had 
advertisements in newspapers, they would advertise on television, they would advertise and then online, and they waited for customers to come. Now they actually do prospect now. I get enormous numbers of like, you know, I don't know, during, during COVID when all of the chips were not available for cars and there was a shortage of cars, I kept getting, you know, the, the dealership that sold me my truck wanting to buy the truck back. I probably should have sold it. I could have sold the truck at one point in time for more money than I had actually paid for. They offered me more money than I'd actually paid for my truck because there was just such a shortage of heavy duty trucks out there. But what would I, you know, that I would have been without a truck for, I figured I'd have to wait a year or two before I could afford to buy another truck, but I probably should have done it. I should have considered that, but they now are sending out, they're prospecting. I, I'm not sure they're doing it well, but they are, you know, historically they didn't do that. Most business to business relationships, you didn't have somebody that was, um, you know, just walking in the door. You had to actually go out and prospect. You had to, I'll get you. I would say 75% to the sales rep and then 25% to the manager. How because do you it's not based on how much time you put in. It's based on your skill and skill of closing the deal. I think prospecting is prospect? far more skill. I think it takes I think actually skill. collecting the money and closing the deal is. I think that's the easy part. That is the easy part. I think prospecting is a lot harder. Now that I'm listening to all this, there is more time that goes into prospecting. Um, trying pro to find the right person to mm -hmm. sell to. Right. To make it successful yeah. versus it not, because you don't want to waste your time on somebody that's not going to buy. Right, exactly. I'm fascinated by copiers, not going to buy one. Right. You don't, I don't want to waste my right. time on that. Right. But if you prospect yeah. well enough, then the sale is e not easy, but you the prospecting the takes your time it and the time, time is what you're paying for. You had a, you had. It's irrelevant now. I was just going to say, I Kelly blue booked my car. And then after I did that, I started getting a whole bunch of text messages and emails about people. Worst mistake I've ever Yeah. <laughs> Terrible. Right. Yeah. So you, I, because we have the ability to analyze data and have an enormous amount of data. Yeah. The minute you Google anything, the minute you say things, I mean, it, it's, it's creepy. So I was, when I was looking for my, the last plane that I bought, I was driving down the road with my mother. We were going to go look at this airplane and the phone, I had an Apple. This was, when did I buy that plane? Five years ago, five or six years ago. The phone is just sitting in the car next to me. And I said, we're going to Wiley. She said, where is this one located? And I said, Wiley Post. And the phone, I open it up, I hit the Maps app, and it's already come up with Wiley Post, which means that the artificial intelligence, Siri, is listening to you the entire time, every conversation that we have. Like, I've got my phone now. It's listening as we speak. Because if, I, if, I, if you say something, it just automatically starts. How many of you... Notice that it, it like sort of knows where you're going. You open it up in the morning and it says 36 minutes to UCO yeah, or, or whatever it is. I mean, it's, it's a little creepy. It's creepy. And it's yeah. different per day of the week. Well, yeah. yeah. It knows yeah. when you go. Right. To it's like things. I have a kid that does dance and they're requesting all this stuff to be bought. It's just popping up on my Amazon, like uh -huh. advertisements for these things that have never popped up. Yeah. In the early ages, this was actually one of the uh, big case in ethics and marketing. In the early ages of tracking people based on their purchases, the, the uh, customer rewards programs, Target had figured out what pregnant women buy <laughs> based on, you know, they, based on just, this was, this was, this was literally 20 years ago when big data was in its infancy. Yeah. And so they started sending coupons to this house, to this young girl, a teenage girl, for baby items, for pampers, for breast pumps. And her father got very upset and went to Target and wanted to know 
why they were sending his daughter these kinds of ads. Why did they think that that you know she had a Target's reward rewards card? Why were they sending stuff to her? Well, it turns out that they had figured out somehow that pregnant women buy certain types of food, and they had used that to predict if you bought this combination of food items, they used that to predict that, that she was pregnant. She hadn't told her parents that she was pregnant. And it ended up being, you know, a, a, a debacle for, <laughs> for the family. And what, what kinds of boundaries do we have in terms of privacy now? I mean, this is a huge thing in marketing. Do we have any privacy? I no. I don't think we do. I, I don't think we have a lot of privacy left. I don't think we have a lot, but I think we do to an extent where they're still, they don't 100% sell your information. So do you like, know that though? They already know. Yes, they do. You do. You I mean, not that everyone they don't? sells your information. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I do. I work for a marketing company, and they we have no access to any of the information from any of the people that we geofence and stuff like that. So I think that's like fine with this still. But I I can not disagree. All com- not all companies are that. Yeah. Not all companies are that ethical. No, they are not. Right? A I lot know. of them are less than you know perhaps wonderful with regard to what it is that we are. uh... Like, we'd love to have their information, honestly, but we can't get it from our provider. They won't provide it with us. Okay. Let's go to the second one. Mandatory urinalysis for nicotine. This one was a healthcare insurance company who started screening their employees. And if they smoked, they gave them a certain amount of time to quit smoking. And if they didn't, they fired them. What do you all think of this? That, now, I will tell you that when this case came out and I started talking about this in this class years and years and years ago, everybody was horribly offended by that. Um, we are a, as, as a state, unfortunately, we have a lot of smokers and people, I, I will tell you that I've seen a huge transformation even in the last 10 years regarding this. When we opened our business in 1986, and my mother said it was a non-smoking establishment. We had a lot of people like, I can't, if I can't smoke in my room, I'm not coming. To the point where I don't know that there's any hotel anymore, except the casinos that allows you to smoke. And even most of the casinos, if they have a hotel with it, they don't allow you to smoke. I can tell you that the Chickasaw don't. At uh, Windstar, by the way, we have the world's largest casino in Oklahoma. Yes, we do. And it is right down on the uh, southern border. I cannot figure out why the state of Texas has not figured out that they lose a huge amount of revenue to the state of Oklahoma in terms of betting because they don't allow for tribal gaming. And so there's a huge amount of gambling leakage that goes from the south to the north right across that the Red River. Do you think it's a pride thing with Texas? Or them wanting to be their own... I, you know, I don't know because it, historically what it was, it, it was about not promoting sin. Now, the interesting thing about that, all of these <laughs> sorts of sin taxes that we have, is that Texas had absolutely no problem selling pornography because you used to, it was kind of crazy. There was a it's porn store there. right it's across the it's Red still River there. and you had the casinos, so it was like, <laughs> yeah. which which sin is it that <laughs> we that we're we're you know Oklahomans were fine with gambling, but not apparently with pornography. Now, in, in a in a highly technologically sophisticated age, Miller versus California, which was the case that uh, was it's a 1973 case, I believe, that decided whether or not you could limit so. The Supreme Court used to actually have a viewing room. Um, Miller versus California, 1973, I'm pretty sure that's right. And what the case said was, so we have this thing called the First Amendment of the United States, and the First Amendment says Congress shall make no law, you know, and then it lists five substantive rights. And one of those substantive rights that's listed in the, in the First Amendment is the freedom of speech. And so we have all this case law on what is speech. 
And the court has never held that you have an absolute right to free speech. They've, they've limited free speech. And one of the ways that they've limited it was with regard to what they called pornography. And they used to have this viewing room where they would go and they would meet until Sandra Day O'Connor was nominated to the bench. And then they did away with it because they, you know, these, these eight old men did not want to go into a viewing room with a female justice and watch and have to determine whether or not something was pornographic. <laughs> Miller came up with the seminal test on what was what constituted pornography and whether or not you could limit that. And so the Miller test uh, says that the work taken as a whole depicts a patently offensive act. The work taken as a whole depicts a patently offensive act. The work taken as a whole, the second prong, depicts a sex, an act of a sexual nature. So there's, you know, patently offensive, then it's of a sexual nature. And then the third prong of the test was what was called the slaps test. The work taken as a whole lacks serious literary, artistic, political, or social value. So one of the things when I used to teach this course, when I taught constitutional law, was what is always going to be legal in all 50 jurisdictions. And the idea behind Miller was that maybe it allowed for what was called community standards, and maybe what was acceptable to sell in California would not be acceptable in the buckle of the Bible Belt in Oklahoma, for example. Right? Mm -hmm. But you have to take the work as a whole. So the work taken as a whole depicts something that is patently offensive, right? The work as a whole depicts something that's patently offensive. The work taken as a whole depicts a sexual, an act of a sexual nature. And the work as a whole lacks serious literary, artistic, political, or social value. That's called slaps, right? So we've got three prongs to the test. You have to meet each prong. So it's offensive, patently offensive, the work taken as a whole, sexual, and then slaps. Serious, literary, artistic, political, or social value. What work is going to be legal in all 50 jurisdictions under that? Well, historically, it was Playboy. Because it's the work taken as a whole. It's artistic. What did Playboy have in it? They had articles. Articles. And they actually had articles that were written, and there were actually writers who published in Playboy that won Pulitzer Prizes. There were some pretty good articles yeah. in Playboy. So the work taken as a whole, right? So this is the test. Now, with regard to Miller, it's still good law. I don't think the Supreme Court has ever officially come out and said, like they did with Roe versus Wade, Miller is no longer good law. But it's been severely compromised because in an age of the internet, it used to be you could control that. So in Oklahoma, you could you can still control gambling. Although it's harder. It's harder even to control gambling now because you've got online gambling, right? We could control, we could say, well, we're going to allow gambling in Oklahoma, but we're not going to allow pornography. And in a day and age when you had to buy a tangible item in order to view this stuff, you could control it. It's hard to control in an age in which the internet prevails and it's hard to regulate what people view on their devices, right? So going back to the smoking, this is one of these sin things and it was amazing to me how much we've come uh, and how far we've come in even places like Oklahoma where people like are, are like, you know, committed smokers. And this company decides that they're going to outlaw it. And they give these, these people a, a, a set of time. And when I first started teaching this class, and we talked about this case, overwhelmingly my students were morally offended that you would tell somebody that, that they can't smoke. You know, what they do in their own, own free time. Well, this is a utilitarian argument. And the president of the company says, look, what happens is smokers cost all of us more money. Because it raises, if I'm not a smoker 
and UCO does this now. I, I can't believe, we, I remember when we did this. You now, if you are on UCO insurance and you use tobacco products, you pay more. I think it's $150 a month more for your insurance than non-smokers do. And it's going to be interesting to see when somebody gets really sick and they, you know, get a, a, a UA or something like that and it comes up that they're a smoker and they're not because they live with a smoker. And that was the next thing that this guy did. He started saying, well, if your spouse smokes, we're going to fire you because you're exposed to secondhand smoke. If we, if you test by, and you will test by, if you live with a smoker and they smoke in your house or in your car, you will test positive for nicotine. Now, this is, you know, obviously in the past, before Oklahoma legalized medical marijuana, in the past, it was interesting to me, my students had no problem with firing somebody who had taken pot, but they did have a problem firing somebody who was smoking. Most of my students anymore don't have a problem with either, firing either. And now most of them, if they've gone anywhere, they've gone the other way because marijuana is medical, right? It, it's, a, it's medicinal. You need that. Do you need that? I don't know. How many of you know Bob Kaiser? The day that we voted on medical marijuana, um, Bob and I had a meeting in downtown Oklahoma City to look at a venue for our sales competition. It was the first year that we were starting the sales competition. And I had my I Voted sticker on. And Bob said, well, everybody pretty well knows that I'm the liberal in the college business, right? I'm, I, I will tell you that I'm probably the only sort of Bernie Sanders style socialist business professor that you will ever meet. And Bob's like, well, I can guess how you voted. And I said, I wouldn't be so sure about that, Bob, but I can certainly guess how you voted. He's like, well, of course I voted now. And he's like, and you're going to lose. And I'm said again, I, I don't, I'm not so sure you should assume that you know how I voted because even though you have a tendency to be liberal or conservative, you know, one or the other, we're all a mixture of different things, right? And historically, I have been pretty opposed to uh, the legalization of drugs. But I told Bob, I said, you're, you're going to lose. And he's like, no, I'm not. I'm going to win. You're going to lose. And I'm like, no, Bob. And I'm going to tell you why you're going to lose. My best friend's mother, who is 79 years old at the time, rented. She sings in the Methodist choir of the First Methodist Church of Norman and has for 35 years. And when it became legal, when recreational marijuana became legal in Colorado, she and every other woman in the Methodist choir rented a party bus to take them <laughs> to Colorado to smoke pot. When the 80-year-old women of the First Methodist Choir are going to Colorado, you have lost this fight. <laughs> You've lost. And he did. You have lost at that point. And I, I thought it would pass, but I thought it would squeak by. It didn't squeak by. It was, it was an overwhelming vote, so right, yeah. in, in favor of the passage and Oklahoma of the medical marijuana. We're not as liberal as Colorado, which has recreational of the medical marijuana. We have the most liberal. Right? Mm -hmm. well, and so it's, it's interesting to me that how we flipped on this one with, if you start asking about other substances besides nicotine, what about alcohol? Just as many people probably die of alcohol abuse every year as die of nicotine. Should we limit that? That one's harder, that one is harder to tell because it doesn't stay in your system as long as nicotine does or as long as marijuana does. Did you get tested whenever you like start working here? Is that how they know your health insurance or do they just ask you? They just ask you. And so if you they lie, ask. your health insurance doesn't go up? If, so if you, if you 
have insurance from somebody else. Like if I had a spouse who had insurance and I got, I, they wouldn't ask me that question. I would, I would just deny. I would just, I would, um, I would basically decline coverage and it wouldn't matter. But if you accept coverage, they ask you the question and they tell you that if you lie, you know, they'll, they'll deny your coverage, which is kind of a hollow threat because we have Obamacare and you can't, I mean, you know, so, um, but I mean, it's interesting. It'll be interesting to see if, because you're exposed. I mean, if you, if you work in a bar, for example, there are still people that are, that are exposed to cigarettes. You could be walking down the street and be exposed right. to it. Yeah. And there are lots of people who, who develop lung cancer now. It didn't <clears throat> used to be this way, but because we have so many environmental toxins and people are living longer, lots of people who have never smoked are developing things like lung cancer because it, you're just exposed to so many toxins. What about the firing of an employee who is considering having an abortion? This one is an actual case that involved a young lady who, because she was under emotional stress, she told one of her coworkers that she had been raped and she was considering having an abortion. It became such a, a, a point of contention in her workplace that they fired her for creating what they called a hostile work environment. What do you think about that one? They, filed, they fired, they fired the girl who was thinking about having the abortion. Oh. Well, I kind of have mixed opinions on that. Uh, it is kind of a private situation, so why are you bringing that into ex telling everybody? A lot of people say that, a lot of students, but is it is it normal for people to talk about their problems with their coworkers? I don't personally. I'm one of those that try and keep work and home separate because when I tend to get them meshed together, it's not good for me personally. So I have to keep those separate. I have to check it at the door. So you don't talk to your coworkers at all about your personal life? Hell no. They don't know that you're married, divorced, kids, nothing about you? Most of them, no. Really? Yes. I feel like you are welcome to share about like your personal life, but I would say that most people are not super just apt to sharing their medical anything. Just because I feel like oh, it's private. Oh, you might be surprised. Uh, there are, no, there are a lot of people like, that, oh, I have this. Personally, like, don't talk to me about it, everybody. I will shut you down because I don't want to hear Gross. I've had students tell me. I've had um, I've had female students tell me that they're they. I, I've had multiple more than one. Not not a huge amount, but I've done this for twenty seven years now. I've had uh, three that have told me that they're going to miss class because they're they're going to have an abortion. What? I don't know why they tell me this. I, I literally I literally like I'm like I, I don't even know. You just say you have a like, doctor's appointment. And they right. just straight up tell you. Or say nothing. Just don't show I, I guess it's because they provided me with like, you know, they wanted to know if I wanted a note. Or support, or, maybe? I don't know. Um, I can tell you that one of them was was very distraught and I didn't, I, I, I didn't, I was very young. I was 25 at the time. <laughs> And I, I didn't, I mean, like, I, I was kind of like, I, I don't know what to do. I mean, you don't know what to do with this information? Yeah, she was crying and she was in my office. And I was like, I, I think we need to go talk to the counseling center about about this. Because this is obviously, you know, and I, I'm not qualified to 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 deal with that. So, it's the reason I don't practice divorce law. I, I will tell you, I tried divorce law once and, like, my client was crying. And I'm like, I just, I, I can't, I cannot help you. Until you can, like, tell me rationally what it is you want. I, I, I can't do this. So I'm just not good at it. So going back to the scenario, if there, I'm against somebody getting fired or having a medical procedure done like an abortion. But if you are, say, gossiping about it in the work area, then you could be causing disruption in work and problems. And People could be talking about this instead of getting work done. So I can see why not both fire sides. the why not fire the people that created the, the ruckus. That's what I was. Thinking. You know, I mean, why why fire the why because fire the you're the, the one that how are they the victim if they're the one putting their information out there for everybody? To I know. think that everybody who I, I think that like ninety percent of the people who would 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 say that somebody who has experienced a rape and has this traumatic experience and tells people, I, I think that they would say that that's the victim. I mean, yes, they're the Most victim. Most people would but say that's the victim. That, that's not what I'm trying to say. You're putting all this information out in the public. You expect people not to talk about it? I, you have lost your mind. I 
would expect <laughs> that. And and I think the polls show this. We are so today. This is a this is a political marketing day. We are going to the polls in a lot of places around the country, and we will we will get an a, a glimpse into how voters feel about these issues. And in Ohio, for example, they are voting on the abortion issue. Everywhere that the voters have had the opportunity to speak in in Kansas, which is ruby red Kansas, not as ruby red as Oklahoma. Oklahoma is the only state that had not one single county vote for Barack Obama twice, yes. right? Even Texas, even ruby red Texas and even ruby red Kansas had counties that voted for Barack Obama. Not many, but at least one. Oklahoma is the only state that has none, no one voted, not one county voted for Barack Obama. Everywhere, even in Kansas, as red as it is, when they had the opportunity to vote for uh, the legalization of abortion, they have. Now, we'll see if that holds true, right? Because there, there's, it's on the ballot tonight. So this is a political marketing issue yes, is. that, we, that we will see if the, the pro-choice stands. Most people in this country, overwhelmingly, since 1973, a majority, 55%, since 1973, at least 55% have said they supported the holding of Roe versus Wade. They, they might personally disagree with it. They might personally disagree with, how, they might say, I will never have one, but they believe that it is an individual's, it is up to an individual choice, not the government's choice, yes. right? I, why not fire the people who are creating the ruckus? I, I think most people would say, this is an enormously stressful situation. Any, you know, I, I agree that most people don't talk about these things. But if you do, I, I think the vast majority of people today. Now, your argument may be that with regard to this issue, that we we don't take polls. Right. For example, on if something is right or wrong, we we don't we we don't take a poll, and and say you know, can we enslave half the population? Right, that, we're not going to subject that to a poll. It, even it, no, don't do that. That's creepy, right? There are some things that are a priori wrong. Uh, so you might say, even though a majority of the the and and when voters have voted on this in Kansas, it, it was overwhelming. Yes, right. I mean, like seventy yeah. percent voted in favor. Um, I'm I'm going to guess, you know, if, if I'm betting. I'm going to guess that the pro-life side is not going to win tonight. Could be wrong. I hope not. Could be wrong. But I, I, I'm going to guess that they're not going to come out victorious. What about this one? Denying health benefits to an HIV-positive uh, employee. This one is not a big deal. You yeah. all don't remember this time in, in our history. But this used to be a big deal. Yeah. yeah. I mean, this was uh, a huge deal. I remember the second person to die of what they called bread in New Mexico was a tenant of my mother's. So they didn't mm -hmm. used to call it AIDS or HIV. They didn't know in, in the early 1980s, it actually started appearing in the 70s, but they really didn't know about it. But in the 80s was when they first started to really identify this. It was called bread. It was gay related immune deficiency syndrome. And at that point in time, they believed it was sort of like COVID they thought it was so contagious that maybe it was airborne. They didn't realize that it was only a bloodborne pathogen. And if you coded in a hospital in, in the 1980s, which this individual who rented a, an apartment for my mother did, they wouldn't respond to, to the code after twice. They would, they would respond once, but the second time, if you coded in a the hospital, they thought it was that contagious that, that, that they wouldn't respond. Really? Yeah. And the the... Healthcare costs were astronomical in the 1980s and 1990s. So they were denied health care? Yep. It's called a pre-existing condition. Wow. Obamacare did away with that, right? Obamacare did away with pre-existing conditions, which, by the way, again, political marketing. If you call it Obamacare, people in the past would overwhelm. They don't do this anymore because it's, we've gotten far enough away from his term that people just don't care. But right after Barack Obama... Um, left office and Donald Trump became president. In polls, if you ask people if they supported Obamacare, it was about equal. 
if you called it the Affordable Care Act and you told them what was in it, it was overwhelming support. If you said things like, it prevents insurance companies from denying you coverage for pre-existing conditions, people overwhelmingly said they supported that. Wasn't right. that Probably supposed to help like a lot of cancer patients? Yes, because and, okay. in the past, so companies would do this. Like, you know, if you had, if you had, now, now this is HIV, but let's take it one step further. How many of you, and I have not done this because I am terrified of this. And it was, it's largely as a result of the fact that I remember a time when pre-existing conditions could be excluded from healthcare coverage. And that, that's, tra I mean, like basically what you were saying, somebody who was HIV positive in the 1990s, if you denied them healthcare coverage because it's so expensive, the drugs at that time were so expensive, you were basically giving them a death sentence because it was hundreds of thousands of dollars a year to treat them. It, that's not the case anymore, right? The drugs have gotten better, they come down anymore. And one of the things that's sort of horrific to me about your generation is that because you have always lived in a world with HIV, you don't remember a world without it, you're not as terrified of it as those of us who remember the early days of, of the disease. And, and what it could do to, to you. It was a death sentence if you denied them healthcare coverage, right? Yeah. I, I think I remember as a kid, there were like um, full communities, uh, apartment complexes in New York that were yes. all, is, okay, yes. yeah. so that was a true story. I think I yes. remember seeing that on the news as yeah. a child. Yeah, that were dedicated to um, helping individuals who were dying yes. of, of AIDS. Yeah. Um, so we've, we've come a long way, but it's no longer HIV, but we could do, how many of you, so going back to my question, how many of you have done something like the genetic 23andMe? Only one? I'm t I like, I, because again, I remember, you know, one of the things that this genetic testing could tell you is whether or not you are likely to develop certain cancers, whether or not you are likely to be, uh, you know, um, subject to... A heart attack, stroke, I mean, all kinds of different conditions. And that's, you know, somewhat good. There's benefits to this. One of the things that is a benefit is the way we treat cancer, even in the last five to 10 years, is radically different. In, in the past, if you had breast cancer, they just lopped off your breasts and they treated it one way, right, with the same drugs. Now, because of targeted gene therapy, it's very specific in the ways that we're able to do this. But it is also enormously costly to do that. And so we could, in theory, if we didn't have things like the Affordable Care Act, start denying not just to HIV employees, but to people who were testing or screened for certain types of cancers that would be enormously difficult to battle and, um, and, and costly. What about pre-employment psychological testing? So, Lots of you have probably taken this completely unscientific and the management department here loves this test. I absolutely hate it. I cannot, I, I just, every time they use it, I cringe. I want to scream. I, I just like want to throw something at them. It's called the Myers-Briggs. How many of you have taken it? I'm sure mm -hmm. all of you have taken the Myers-Briggs, right? God, I just, it's not a scientific test. Horribly, you know, not, not valid. But there are tests that are much more, much more valid. The best one is something called the Minnesota Multiface Personality Inventory, the MMPI. And if you've ever taken this test, it's, I don't know, like the, the long form of the test is something like 500 questions, right? And the MMPI is very good at pinpointing personality disorders. One of the questions on the MMPI that was asked was, or I'll give you several of the questions. I wish I didn't think about sex so much. I have difficulty concentrating because I think about sex so much. Um, I believe that there is one true God. These are questions on the MMPI. Uh, I have never, this is the one that really kills me. I have never had difficulty starting, stopping, or holding my urine. How do you feel about those kinds of questions? It's a little personal. Uh, not psychological. Is it? Uh, that, that generally, people who use the MMPI, you're not looking for specific answers. 
and they don't generally provide employers that use it with your answers to specific questions like I believe there is one true God. What they're looking for, what the MMPI looks for is inconsistencies. Okay. And your so it'll ask the same question multiple yes, times. Like form. yeah, like I I wish I were not bothered by sex. I think about sex far too often. You know, <laughs> I believe that there is only one, you know, true religion, things like that. And and then it it, it you know can tell us whether or not you have, in theory, certain psychosis. I have a tendency to think, by the way, that all of psychology is witchcraft. I mean, it's like the closest thing to witchcraft we teach on a college campus. Lay on the couch and tell me your problems. Yeah, no. It's, it, it's, it's voodoo. It, you know, like voodoo. But to the extent that it's scientific, it is the more valid of them. What do you think about that kind of testing? Should we test for people? Does it matter... With regard to this kind of testing, psychological testing, does it matter whether or not you're testing for, let's say, a administrative assistant position at the University of Central Oklahoma versus a police officer position at the University of Central Oklahoma? You don't think it matters? I think it matters. Yeah, it depends on where it depends on where you're employed. It depends on what position you hold. I think police officer. I'm far more willing to allow psychological mm -hmm. testing yes. than administrative assistant. Yeah. Like I, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty comfortable with, you know, like the man that we're going to give the gun. Maybe we want to know. Want to know if he's right you know, in the head or not? Yeah, I mean, like yeah. maybe we want to know that. The administrative assistant. I don't know. I mean, my dad does um, psychological testing. He owns a real estate investment company, so he does it for before he employs people to see which position they'd be better in. A lot of people use it that way. I think that's maybe not a great way of using it, but we collect so much information about people now, and we have this ability that a lot of people are using this. By the way, it is very dangerous outside of things like police departments and stuff like that, because what you can run afoul of is something called the Americans with Disabilities Act. If you're if you're screening out and denying people, because again, that's a pre-existing condition, and if you're screening out people because they haven't, if you know. Mental illness is a disability. It is. Whether we want to acknowledge it or not, it is a disability. And it's very easy to run afoul of, of the ADA. I'm out of time, so we will um, finish this and talk about employee responsibilities next time as well. Let me take a picture. So. Um, do we have a class discussion coming due soon? Uh, I don't know. I'd, I would have to look. I will try and get your test graded. Uh, I know that I have been a little slow on that because I was gone last week to NCSC, so I'll try and get that done quickly. Let me stop the video and if you have ducks. Thank you.